Sports Center's on your television. Another hour take up till one o'clock here in the East, and then we got Sports Center from LA. Zubin, John Anderson, glad to have you. A uh, hundred years ago, they got together in a car and auto showroom and decided to put together the NFL. Had a bunch of rogue teams all over, put them together, made a league. Hundred years later, we're starting the season with the Hall of Fame game. We are September fifth. It'll be Bears Packers. Slightly more exciting, perhaps some would say, no. than what you're saying here. All right, let's go. Falcons Broncos Hall of Fame game at the Hall of Fame Stadium, named in honor of the late great Saints owner Tom Benson. Some of the guys getting honored and some of the teams they're attached with. You saw Champ Bailey there, former Bronco, Tony Gonzalez, the former Falcon. Those are Pat Bolin, the Broncos owner's kids. It'll be a very contentious fight to see which one of those six takes over. No Flacco tonight, but Ed Reed, his old teammate, was there. Vic Fangio, the story of the day, he's got kidney stones. The stone is not passed. But when you're that age and you're getting your first NFL gig, it's going to take a lot to keep you off the sideline. Drew Locke didn't start for the Broncos. Kevin Hogan did, but Locke is obviously the future in Denver post Flacco. A little bit too much air on that to Noah Fant, their first-round draft pick out of Iowa, who's actually had a little bit of an up-and-down camp. The guys on the broadcast said Dan Quinn, who's now taking over the Falcons' play-calling duties, is very high on John Kaminsky, and you can see why. Locke paying the price. It looks like he was having a little trouble processing everything that was happening. You can imagine the speed of the game a little bit different. And then, man, he's having all sorts of problems. But the real thing here wasn't the Falcons or the Broncos. It was the new macro rules changes, including P.I., calling it or not calling it. This is Benkert, the kid out of Virginia, going deep to Russell Gage, and we're going to have a flag on the play. Fangio, the Broncos head coach, is going to challenge the P.I. call. Now, let's take a look at Article 5 in the rule book, newly instituted, as you know, football fans. Pass interference is now a reviewable play. It includes both called or not called. Either way, if you think you were robbed or you think it was too much, you can throw it. You can kind of see the arm on the jersey there. So you knew the Broncos were going to lose that. They did. Subsequently, they lose a timeout. Though Al Michaels and Chris Collinsworth on the broadcast were saying he partially may have called it just to see what the process was like. Nobody's ever gone through this particular rule change before. Matt Schaub is still with the Falcons, and he's still playing mediocre football. He's knocked down there. He's going to get picked off by Trey Johnson. Take another look, and, you know, if you're playing in this game in the fourth quarter, John, I think it's fair to say a pick like this is going to help you maybe make 53 or 52 on the squad, right? At least get through the first cut. Right. You want to maybe on special teams, do everything you can. And then Rippin, the kid out of Boise State, nephew of Mark Rippin, hits Jawan Winfrey. That ended up being the game-winning score for the Broncos, who would go on to win this by a final of 14-10. But the real question after the game for first-year head coach Vic Fangio is how did his first year and perhaps future quarterback Drew Locke look in limited action? Here's the coach on the kid from Mizzou in a Broncos win. I, I, I was hoping for more, but not surprised. You know, he's still got a lot of work to do. I uh, thought his accuracy wasn't clean all the time, uh, along with his reads. But, you know, that's to be expected. You know, we've got four more games. We, we've got to get him ready, more ready than he is right now. Well, from Canton to Connecticut, smells like football. We welcome <laughs> in Michelle Steele live from the side of the Hall of Fame game to talk about the Stones, Mick, Keith, and Kidney. Uh, Denver head coach Vic Fangio <laughs> dealt with kidney stones to start the day. He's still out there coaching. What did he say post game about his health? Yeah, John, from Connecticut to Canton to kidney stones, so much of what happens in life is timing, right? Here you've got Vic Fangio. He's been an assistant in the National Football League for 32 years. He's just been waiting for his shot. And the same day that he is supposed to make his head coaching debut, he wakes up with kidney stones, but you know what? That was not going to stop him from being on the sideline today. Uh, that was never in question, really. There, there was a 20-minute or 40-minute time period where I didn't know if I'd make it, you know, but it was, it, I think uh, it was never in question. You know, as we all know, you know, nobody's in there doing cheetah flips and cartwheels about that like they would in a regular season game. But winning's cure, cured more ills than penicillin, and um, it's always nice to win. 
winning cures all. Ain't that the truth? Now, there's so much that a new head coach has to think about on the first day, even if it's the preseason, you know, evaluating their second-round draft pick in Drew Locke or even in uh, Fangio's case, just to think about where he was going to stand on the sideline. Remember, this is a guy who's watched games from the box for 30 years. He's still not totally comfortable about where he's going to stand on the sideline. So we talk about these preseason games as being meaningless. The fact that he got the win, played or coached through pain, is going to have a memorable story after the fact. It's going to make this game just a, a little more meaningful, I think, for Vic Fangio. In good spirits, I got to tell you, John, he took about 15 questions about kidney stones. So, you know, credit to him there. Oh, some guys need Gatorade, some guys need Flomax. You never know what happens. <laughs> All right, so here's the latest on the posturing with Zeke Gate. Jones, Jerry, posturing, saying, I don't need a running back to win a Super Bowl, even though he kind of has to have had that in the, in the past with Emmett. And he told Zeke, was Zeke listening 1,200 miles away, chilling in Cabo? Todd Archer on Jerry's latest comments today. Zubin, Jerry Jones has confidence a deal be done with Ezekiel Elliott. When I've ever not done one, the owner said after Thursday's practice, he just doesn't have a sense of urgency as to when. In fact, he said he didn't see a point, quote, months into the season. Elliott's holdout reached seven days Thursday. The Cowboys continue to talk with his agent about a contract, but a deal isn't necessarily close. Jones said the deal has to be right for the Cowboys so their house doesn't fall. I don't want to seem trite. I don't want to seem cavalier about it, but I have a little more uh, patience with uh, how things are going to get done and the necessity to have angst when you have it, right. to make sure that you, uh, at the end of the day, have this thing as complete, complete being as much talent that we have on this team under the same roof as we can. That's impossible to do, but uh, you got to really try hard to get it done. That's what we're doing. Zubin, in addition to Elliott, the Cowboys have to work out deals for Dak Prescott and Amari Cooper. When asked if Michael Thomas's contract with New Orleans impacted his deal, Cooper joked, hopefully, Zubin, a lot of work to be done on these contracts. And Todd and John, on the other side of the ball, Jalen Smith, Leighton Van Der Esch, Byron Jones, all these guys are going to want a ton of cash. Zeke could be fined $40,000 a day under Article 42 of the CBA for missing camp as many days as he has. It's now at six days. But there's no guarantee that that's happened or Jerry is imposing that. The biggest thing you need to know is at the bottom of the screen, he could lose in a crude season, meaning he could actually have to wait an extra year before hitting unrestricted free agency where the big money would flow from Dallas or perhaps someone else. Melvin Gordon still not in Chargers camp. His agent told our Josina Anderson he requested last week that the team trade Gordon out of L.A. if they can't get a new contract. Uh, so that's ongoing there. Todd Gurley got fresh cash for four years last offseason. He's got a cranky left knee that people worry about. So load management's a thing for him in training camp. Lindsay Theory covering L.A.'s team together today. Todd Gurley is on an every other day practice plan as the Rams carefully monitor his workload. That plan did include participating in practice against the Chargers. Gurley took the opening handoff from Jared Goff in several series and also caught a few passes out of the backfield as he appeared fresh and energized throughout the two hour workout. However, afterward, Gurley did not seem as energized or in the mood to entertain questions about his health and more particularly about his knee. Football is football. I'm out here practicing, basically. But is your knee doing okay? I'm out here practicing. I thought he looked really good, Lindsey. You know, good command. Even just his energy when he's talking to his teammates, he's got a natural enthusiasm about him that you can't help but just get excited, and he brings up the level of, of everybody around him. So it uh, looked like he did a really nice job. Important to note, Gurley's reps through his three practices have been somewhat limited because of a deep running back rotation that includes Malcolm Brown and third-round pick Daryl Henderson. With the Rams, I'm Lindsey Theory, ESPN. Yeah, these two fellows are sort of tied to get Gurley drafted 10th overall 2015, five spots ahead of Gordon out of Wisconsin. Both began their NFL careers in different cities before they converged in L.A. Both have been very good in their short careers, ranking at or near the top in several categories offensively for the running backs. Bolts, though, don't have Gordon. Doesn't mean they don't have backs. Today we had uh, five other running backs working today. Yeah, I, I, and they're working hard. Yeah. They're working hard. Uh, JJ's doing a good job. Austin had a couple of nice runs today. You know, uh, Jeremy's coming along well, being a rookie and all, playing both positions. Uh, I'm really happy with uh, 
development of some of those young guys right now? I mean, he's talked to us all separately. He talked to us before um, camp. Um, you know, obviously, you know, he's got to do what he's got to do. You know, we're holding it down until he gets back. Um, but we all love him. You know, he's a part of this room. Um, he's, a, he's a great leader. Um, and, you know, we're just, like I said, waiting on him to get back. Um, but until then, we're all just trying to, you know, carve out a piece of, of where we might fit into this, uh, into this offense, um, each individually. Caesars Sportsbook. That's uh, the folks in Vegas. Yes. That's where you gamble. Yes. Okay. They give Melvin Gordon's team the second best odds to win the division at plus 200 or 2-1. Two to one. Kansas City, best odds at minus 150. ESPN Football Power Index gives Los Angeles 24% chance to win the division, while KC is at 